This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Hello and welcome. I'm Peter Smith, Professor of Political Science here at the University of California, San Diego. I have also served as the director of the Center for Iberian and Latin American Studies and for several years hosted Hemiscope for UCSD TV. Tonight, it's my pleasure to be your host for UCSD at 50, a year-long series celebrating UC San Diego's 50th anniversary. UC San Diego is home to the Moores Cancer Center, known, not surprisingly, for its innovative and collaborative research leading to new treatments for cancer. But that's only the half of it. Less known but equally important is the center's focus on the patient. Nobody wants to get sick, of course, and we wish the best of health to you all. But if you or someone you care about is facing the challenge of a cancer diagnosis, this is where you want to turn. More now from the Dean of UCSD School of Medicine, Dr. David Brenner. The vision when the Moore's Comprehensive Cancer Center was developed was that at the exact same site we would do both patient care and research. And it was a lot of thought went into it. Patients and the scientists mix in the lunchroom, in, in the places for rest and relaxation. So all of us on the science side see our patients from small children to the elderly at various stages of disease. And I think it makes us aware we're not doing this for fame and fortune, we're doing this for our patients. As usually you think of a cancer center, everybody must be morose and down all the time. I think there's generally a positive attitude. Rather than being discouraged by the patients we see, we're full of conviction about making things better with them as part of the solution, so we're working together. I will see patient groups meeting in different common rooms to discuss nutrition, to discuss yoga, to discuss um, alternative therapies, uh, to, to, give, to give group support. It just makes it such a wonderful place. My God, is that a great place? Everybody there is friendly. Everybody there treats me like a human being. I walk into that place. I am the most important person coming into that building that there is. There are 40 NCI, National Cancer Institute, designated comprehensive cancer centers in the United States. And UC San Diego Moore Cancer Center is one of them. And our mission is to bring research advances to patients. The vast majority of our patients come here because they know that we have therapies on offer that they can't find anyplace else. We've been able to attract amazing people in um, surgical oncology and medical oncology to come to UC San Diego to practice here, to teach the next generation of physicians, and to conduct their research. Seeing how colleagues work together here is very gratifying and that people are willing to share their ideas and not hold their cards so close to their chest and say, oh, I, just, I found that in my system too, let's work together on that. I think that's a real strength. In a collaborative institution like Moore's, there will be everything from the geneticist, to the family counselor, to the medical oncologist, to the surgeon. They all work together to come up with a plan for the patient, and they make sure that when new drugs become available, they are available to deliver to the patient. Dennis Carson is one of the few people who actually developed a cure for cancer. He identified the underlying molecular pathophysiology in hairy cell leukemia and, and um, identify a drug to cure it. And so now there is a disease that used to be uniformly fatal that now can be cured. San Diego is one of the centers of the biotechnology enterprise, and the Moore's Cancer Center is one of the main testing arenas for both new diagnostics and new therapeutics. And I think it's been very successful, and it really shows what a university can bring to San Diego. One of our most recent greatest success at Moore Cancer Center has been to develop um, a new therapy for myelofibrosis. Myelofibrosis is a disease in which the bone marrow stops working. It's scarred down and no longer makes red blood cells. I could not walk a half a, half a block 
I could, I could barely make it up one flight of stairs. I slept most of the time. It was demoralizing, depressing, and oh my God, uh, I don't want that life. Uh, Dr. Katrina Jameson worked with a uh, local biotechnology company uh, to bring a uh, drug to the clinic in a year. We knew what the target of the disease was. It had just been cloned. Uh, the DNA had been determined. They were working in a related field. So the clinical trial began within one year of lead compound identification. Because of this very close collaboration between us at the cancer center here and then this drug company up the street, small company, the good news story is the patients have responded really very well to this drug. These patients that were suffering terribly by enlarged spleens, by anemia, by fatigue, were treated and it was miraculous. Their spleens shrunk, their energy increased, their anemia improved. It was one of the most remarkable reversals of a chronic um, disease I'd ever seen. I gained 25 pounds back. My muscle mass is better. I don't worry about falling apart. I do have to schedule and shepherd my energy, but before, I had no energy to shepherd. So all these different institutions came together to make a new um, therapy for a disease that previously had no treatment. And I think it represents um, UC San Diego and the Morris Cancer Center at its best to bring together these diverse interests to improve patient care. In a year, I'm on it, the drug works, you know, I'm zipping around, I'm vital, and I'm involved. People are looking for new approaches to chronic illnesses. And that um, the idea that you could provide an insight to the molecular pathophysiology of a very specific disease, identify a single enzyme that's misbehaving, and target it in a very directed way and get a fantastic clinical result. That is a change in the paradigm. That, that is a new way to approach um, developing of therapies. That's completely different than the way we used to develop drugs, where you just try a whole variety of different types of drugs on different preclinical models and hope one of them had a nice result. When with these kinds of targeted therapies, patients tolerate it better, they can stay on it for long periods of time, and even if the cancer is not cured, it can be suppressed and patient can have a very high quality of life. So these patients become almost, they're, well, they're basically friends. So you don't want to let them down. You get to know them very well. So you want to make sure that if their disease does progress, you catch it before it's beyond the point of no return. You understand your mortality when you are forced to look at it and get close to the edge and you've had enough. But the bottom line is, for you to be successful, you have to make the most out of every day you have. You have to have an attitude that says, I'm a survivor and I am going to keep surviving. And you have to have the desire for your quality of life. The idea that you have a multidisciplinary team using everything available to improve patient care, all in one site, all um, highly integrated, is the future of medicine. Yeah, my aim in coming here uh, was to identify the Moore's Cancer Center as a place where a cure for cancer was found. Not all cancers, but at least one kind of cancer. And you hear about some of the trials that Katrina Jameson are doing, and we have some more coming along. I think we uh, may get there. I think the future is really good. I think, I think this is the, you know, the golden era of um, cancer therapy and, and um, cancer research. I'm Scott Paulson. I'm the University Carol Honor. That means I play the chimes. The way these chimes work, you can see that there's some metal rods, they're specially tuned to sound as if they're a cast bell, and they really sound spectacular. I'm up here on the roof of Geisel Library, on the roof of that spaceship-looking building that's in the middle of campus. I go up a secret stairwell, nine flights of stairs, basically, to get onto the roof. Then I come out into the bright sun, and then I come into this little bunker-like garage structure on the roof, and I turn the amplifier off and practice, and when I'm ready, I'll turn it up to 11, and you'll hear. 
I'm asking people to send in song requests to celebrate UCSD's 50th anniversary. UCSD doesn't have a school song, so I'm just asking all alums, all community members, all staff, everyone who's ever used the library, been on campus, you email me, you tell me what your favorite song is, that'll be the school song, I'll play it. And I can't help but think that maybe it will enrich somebody's day, give them a smile, or make them realize, hey, I should ask for a song too. Our world faces ever-daunting agricultural challenges for which UC San Diego is poised to find solutions. Steve Kay, Dean of Biological Sciences, shares the vision of what plant biology at UC San Diego means for our world. Three of the greatest challenges facing us today are the production of food, a sustainable production of energy, and protecting our natural resources from further environmental damage. There is one field that holds many of the solutions to that type of challenge, the application of plant biotechnologies that are being developed right here at UC San Diego. My own laboratory at UC San Diego studies biological clocks, a particular type of biological clock called a circadian river. Plants have evolved very powerful biological rhythms to take advantage of day-night cycles. And if we want to grow plants that have bigger fruits, larger seeds, higher yields, then understanding the clock is an entryway to manipulating those processes from the point of view of agriculture. So in our laboratory, we're employing advanced robotics, for example, where we test the function of almost all known plant genes so that we're going to ultimately know what every plant gene does in every cell of a plant. One example is we've begun to identify very specific proteins in the plant that are responsible for these growth patterns. So we have now in our hands genes that are responsible for directing plant growth. So we're taking a new view of the plant where we're no longer looking at one or two genes. We're essentially now looking at this globally. We're looking at the actions of genes as if they're a symphony, and we're trying to move the entire orchestra to play a tune that's going to be beneficial to us in terms of manipulating plants for a better agriculture, and move those fundamental discoveries towards real crops in real fields that are feeding real people. While understanding biological clocks will provide tools to create those real improvements, agriculture faces many challenges posed by changes in the environment. Julian Schroeder explains how his lab addresses these emerging problems. It has been estimated that on a global scale, agricultural output may be only about 21% of what it optimally could be. And about 69% of those losses come from environmental stresses. Foremost, drought and water, salt stress, and uh, other related stresses. And so in my laboratory at UC San Diego, we investigate the detailed molecular and cellular mechanisms by which a plant responds to the stress and how it activates responses to possibly circumvent or reduce the negative impacts of those stresses. On top of the problems of drought, salinity uh, for agriculture, we have, through our human activities, been increasing the carbon dioxide, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So this increase in CO2 is also affecting plants and is predicted to adversely affect climate across the globe. So what you see here are some Arabidopsis plants we're doing research on. And in this research that started in my lab a few years ago, we realized very little was known how CO2, the elevated CO2 in the atmosphere that we have today, is affecting plants. So we're studying that in the plant Arabidopsis and then seeing how that affects water use efficiency of these plants. So the question is, can our basic research contribute 
to the solution? And that's, of course, a multi-billion dollar question. And there's, there's no silver bullet that's good news and bad news. Bad news, that's clear why it's bad news. But good news because what's being found is you can turn the knob on the one or the other pathway, improve the response, and improve yields. While Julian's lab helps to find various pathways to increase agricultural yields, our appetite for energy is insatiable. For Stephen Mayfield, the problem is clear, and he is working on a solution that may be found in one of the simplest living things. We have to find a way to replace the fossil fuel we're using now with new sustainable fuels. The oils that come out of algae are 100% compatible with petroleum. In fact, petroleum that we pull out of the ground is simply ancient algae. The difference is that the petroleum was CO2 that was sequestered underground. So when we pull that out and burn it, we release new CO2 into the air. The oil that gets produced by algae, that oil is made by pulling CO2 out of the air and fixing it into that oil. So in fact, what we do is we just recycle CO2 over and over again. So when we talk about making biofuels, there's really two different aspects of that. Um, one is what we would call the in invention part of that. You know, this is new discoveries. How do we get strains that grow quickly? How do we get ones that are resistant to pathogens? How do we make those strains produce high amounts of oil? So that's on the biological side. So part of what we do here is go look at all the different variety of algae out there. We have algae that grow in Antarctica in, in sub-zero temperatures. We have algae that grow in thermal hot springs. We have algae that grow in dry rocks. So the qualities in algae that we look for are the exact same qualities that all of agriculture looks for. We want it to grow very fast and be productive. We want it to be protected from pathogens and pests. We want to be able to harvest it cheaply, and we want to have superior fuels coming out of that. All of those traits have an underlying genetic component to them. And so part of our job is to figure out how does any gene within the algae confer that trait to the algae. So some of those genes, just to give you an example, some of them might be enzymes in the pathway in lipid biosynthesis. So it's pretty easy to imagine, well, if we change those around a little bit, we might be able to change the product profile. So that's a challenge, and it's a challenge because it's not something that we've ever done before. And that's much of what we do here at the University of California, San Diego. We're on the invention side. It's easy for us to see the challenges that are facing our Earth. So how are we contributing to that at UC San Diego? What we've done here is to form something called the Photosynthetic Biology Institute. The Photosynthetic Biology Institute is a vision in which we want to enable our plant scientists so that they can have direct access to producing solutions to some of the biggest challenges facing our global population today. It's a world where computers read our thoughts and emotions. Three teams of UC San Diego researchers are pioneering a new field called brain-computer interface. Walk. Bruce Kelly hopes the new research will help keep him mobile as Parkinson's disease progresses. The degenerative disorder can make Kelly's legs freeze up, especially in narrow spaces. These white columns in the motion capture lab at the supercomputer center simulate an elevator. Freezing episode during the turn. UC San Diego you're cognitive down, scientists Virginia DeSaw and Howard Poisner are using an EEG cap to monitor Kelly's brain. The 64 sensors on his scalp read electrical signals. The idea with the Parkinson's patients is to try to detect from the EEG signal, so from the voltage measured at the scalp, whether they're about to have a freezing episode, so whether they're about to have freezing of gait. The future application would be then if we can detect that, we can present visual 
and or auditory cues that would help them overcome that freezing of gait. Parkinson's patients are known to very heavily rely on external visual or auditory cues in order to guide their movement. So they may be unable to initiate a movement. You put chalk marks down on the floor, they can see where to place their feet and then they can begin to move. The research team is testing 10 people with Parkinson's. The ultimate goal is to develop a portable EEG device that could prevent their legs from freezing in the first place. Sensors could be embedded in a baseball cap or a headband. Virtual reality glasses would display visual images to guide the patient. Emerging technology could help retrain the brain and get people like Kelly out of a pinch. Hi, right, doing good. With Brain Computer Interface, or BCI, a computer not only reads brain activity, but sends signals to an external device, like a wheelchair or a robot, to execute an action. Now, we're not reading people's thoughts as they're, you know, uh, uh, thinking about Shakespeare's lines. Now, that's a long way off. But reading their motor cortex thoughts about how they want to move in which directions and so forth, that's very doable. Upstairs from Poisoner's lab, Saping Zhang is developing ultra-portable BCI hardware from headbands to helmets at the Swartz Center for Computational Neuroscience. So basically we put 16 sensors on the subject head. And as you can see, this setup takes about one minute. No gel or wires are needed for this prototype. 16 spring-loaded electrodes read the user's brain waves and send those signals to a Bluetooth-enabled phone or tablet. Zhang says wireless headsets could help the general population with everyday activities like driving. So if a device can detect and track the cognitive states, in this case, for instance, drowsiness of the drivers, and then decode the signals, trying to give the feedback or the warning signals to the subject when they fall into sleep on the wheel, and then we can save lives. So you as a subject, you need to look at numbers one at a time. Zhang also helped develop a BCI application for people who can't physically dial the phone. A researcher demonstrates with a headband containing four electrodes. He can call a phone number simply by looking at numbers on the screen one at a time. His brain signals are then sent to the cell phone for an automatic dial. Tucked away in another corner of the supercomputer center, musicians show how brain-computer interface can read and express emotion. Scott McCaig is the composer and violinist. There's a cellist, a flutist, and a so-called brainist. You're playing the brain. <laughs> That's Tim Molin. The cognitive science graduate student focuses on one of five distinct emotional states, feeling it fully inside his body. As Mullen enters into the feeling of shyness, 64 sensors on his EEG cap send brain signals to the MobiLab control room. Software translates his mood into a bass tone, which comes through the loudspeakers. This feeling is of one who is uncertain, quiet, shy, and sensitive. The musicians then play the piece that corresponds with this ground tone. The audience would know whether it worked by seeing whether the description that was given of that state, like shy and sensitive, matched the quality of the sound that came out. In this rehearsal, it worked proving that a computer can not only decode basic thoughts, but primal emotions. And the brainist could communicate his feelings through music without even lifting a hand. Founded by UC San Diego alumni, Michael and Richard Antonorsi, Chuao Chocolatier has quickly become a culinary sensation. Well, we began in Encinitas in a small little store. 
in 2002. And uh, my brother and I wanted to set up something new for us. We wanted to discover the challenges of food, chocolate, and many, many different things. The name Chuao is not only a nod to the brothers' home country of Venezuela, but also an insight into their confectionery point of view. You know, we find that many people have a hard time saying Chuao. They say chu, chao, chu, chihuahua, all kinds of things. And to help them say it correctly, we tell them to think that you chew and then you say wow, chew, wow. And if it's not a wow, it's not a chew wow. And our vision is to arouse your senses with unusual, unexpected, and delicious chocolate experiences. And that is exactly what they do. Their unusual flavors have put chew wow on the chocolate map. We did the Spicy Maya, which had become, in the first four or five years of our career, the leading product we have, you know, interpreting a little bit of uh, what the uh, ancient Mexican approach to chocolate would be, using a little cinnamon, pasilla chili, cayenne pepper. In celebration of the 50th anniversary of UCSD, these innovative alums created the Golden Ticket Contest, selling chocolate bars to raise money for scholarships. I feel it's really important because it allows us to give back uh, something that could then eventually allow someone else that doesn't have the means but has the ability and the talent to enjoy the UCSD experience. Winners of the Golden Ticket Contest were invited to take a tour of Chihuahua's factory. Yeah, we're having a group tonight uh, that's going to come in. First, we're going to do a little bit of education. I think we always have to start with a little learning. The big thing is the olfactory center in your body. So, and that's all memory driven because it's connected with all the After memory. that, we're gonna come into the production facility. We're gonna still talk about chocolate, different percentages, uh, colors, and then we're gonna temper our chocolate. We're gonna get hands-on, fixing our chocolate so that we can use it. Then we're gonna make a confection that we're making for Valentine's, which we call the fragolina, which is little strawberry. If you, if you take your time, you know, you don't wanna put too much or too little, and then you just place it there, okay? As the evening went on, it was clear that this tour inspired more than just some finger-licking fun. You know, chocolate is, uh, is amazing. It makes people feel really connected, and it just kind of breaks down all the barriers in my book. There's nothing as interesting as when you're sharing a chocolate moment with a bunch of people that are passionate about chocolate. You can buy these special 50th anniversary bars at all of the major vendors here on campus, or go online at alumni.ucsd.edu slash golden ticket. And a second golden ticket contest is now underway. Lucky winners will get their turn at the Two Hour Chocolatier in May. In the meantime, I thank you all for joining us. I'm Peter Smith. We'll see you next time on UCSD at 50. What would I suggest to um, the Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences at uh, UC San Diego in 50 years? Well, I would tell that person to be very entrepreneurial. I would recommend um, lowering barriers, trying to get multidisciplinary groups to interact, trying to get people from different disciplines e interested in, in healthcare, to bring in the very best in, um, in engineering, in computer science, in um, information technology, in um, management, in, in um, economics, to try to decide how to give the best healthcare and how to make it most effective.